We're glad to present your speaker, Brother Guy N. Woods. There is an erosion of thinking regarding the distinct personality of the Spirit. If a person can have a clear perception of the Holy Spirit as a person, just as much so as the Father or as the Son, it will go far, very, very far in helping one to avoid error uh, touching the work of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is indeed a person, not only a person, not only does he distinctly possess personality, but he's a masculine person. That is, he's a he, and is so designated. Look at the personal pronouns in the passage that I'm about to present, John chapter 16 and verse 13. How be it when he, who is the Holy Spirit of truth, shall come, he shall guide you into all truth. He shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he shall show you things to come. Note that again and again in that passage, the personality of the Spirit is indicated, and of a masculine gender. So the Spirit is a person, a masculine person, a person of the Godhead. A person as much so as the Father or the Son. In the next place, how does he communicate? Here, too, is a vital matter. When people espouse, as some in the world tonight have, that the Spirit communicates through hunches and intuition and so-called inner leadings, well, then they're certain to have acquired a subjective form of religion which largely ignores what the teaching of the Scriptures is on any subject, if their feelings are in conflict with it. And so this, too, is a vital question. How does the Spirit communicate? Well, the answer is, in the only way that it's possible for intelligent beings to communicate, and that by language, words, signs of ideas are their equivalent. Now, if I can establish that, and I can, I will have shown you that the allegation that the Spirit, through so-called inner leading, prompts and causes people to follow certain courses, that this is positively and palpably false. For example, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 2, David said, The Spirit spake by me, and His word was on my tongue. Note that a communication was made by the Spirit to David, that it was made through the use of language. And the medium was uh, constituted by means of words. Well, there's no other way, no other way. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit speaketh expressly, that is, plainly and clearly, that in the lot of times some shall depart from the faith. And in a familiar passage found in the second chapter of Revelation, verse 11, there is that familiar refrain, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Now that, as you will recall, is a statement following each of the letters to the churches of Asia Minor. And here again is emphasized that the medium or mode of communication was by the use of language. There really isn't any other way. So the Spirit is a part of the Godhead. The Spirit is a person. The Spirit has distinct personality. The Spirit is a masculine person. The Spirit communicates with the use of language. Now the next question, what was the function of the Spirit in relationship to man's salvation? There's an interesting thing about the passage that I've just cited, Revelation 2 and 11. It follows each of the letters to the churches of Asia Minor. Bear in mind that our Lord dictated those letters, and John wrote them down. Nonetheless, the text says that we, in hearing them, we hear what the Spirit says. Now, why is it that if the Lord dictated them and John wrote them, that in receiving them, we receive what the Spirit says? Vital matter. Vital indeed. And that's this. 
It was never the function, never the function of the Holy Spirit to originate truth. That function was that of the Father and the Son. And it was the function of the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth that the Father and Son made known to him. Now, if I can establish that, and I certainly can, I will have shown you that the view that some hold today, that the Spirit is making new, fresh, and formerly unknown matters known to the world today, in addition to and apart from and independent of the New Testament, that that's false and hurtful and pernicious. It's just not so. And I shall prove it by the testimony of the Spirit Himself. I already introduced the passage in another connection. John sixteen thirteen. Now look at it from this viewpoint. How be it when He, who is the Spirit of truth, shall come, He shall guide you into all truth. Now watch. He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak and he shall show you things to come. What does that evidence then? It was the function of the Spirit not to originate truth, but to take the truth that was made known to him by the Father and the Son and pass it on. Pass it on to us. So the next question, how and by what means did he pass it on to us? In a wonderful passage that's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning at verse 8, not nearly as familiar, I think, to the average one of us as it ought to be, because it certainly resolves this matter completely, Paul makes three points that are pertinent to our discussion. One, it takes a revelation to know God. Two, that revelation must be made in word. Three, that revelation was made through the pens of men directed by the Holy Spirit. Now watch the statement. Number one, it takes a revelation to know God. Here's Paul, here are Paul's words. I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither is it in the heart of man the things the Father hath in store for them that love him. But the next verse says, He's revealed them to us by His Spirit. So that shows us that we can't know the things of God except by divine revelation, and that that revelation was made by the Holy Spirit. The next point Paul makes is what we've already established from other consideration, that it takes words to constitute a revelation. Watch his statement. What man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man within him? Even so knoweth no man the things of God, save the Spirit of God. That's a simple illustration. That says, in effect, this. Just as you can't possibly know what I'm thinking in any given moment, until I tell you, using words, in like manner, we can't know what's been in God's mind until He tells us, using words. That's simply to say that in the nature of the case, it takes words to constitute a revelation. So that evidences the fact of the matter and the means. Now next, how it was done. Watch his statement. Which things also we speak, quoting now directly from Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, which things also we speak, we whom? Paul and other inspired men. Which things we speak, speak, mind you, using words. Well, how, Paul? Note it. Not in words of man's wisdom. Well, that eliminates the human element. Not in words of man's wisdom. Well, then how? Note it. In the words of the Holy Spirit. So the words of the book are the words of the Holy Spirit. The revelation that the Holy Spirit made through those men, guided and directed by His power. Now, our next question Where is that deposit of truth as it relates to us tonight? Well, quite obviously, in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God who at sundry times, that is, many times, and in divers manners many different ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. So the message to us is through His Son. And this, of course, through the New Testament book. 
To what extent? Our next question, does it meet our need? In Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 7 and 18, Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, completely furnished to every good work. The King James Version says that the man of God may be thoroughly, not thoroughly, look at the spelling. In most Bibles, at least the older Bibles, is thoroughly. Well, the American Standard more clearly indicates it there, that the man of God may be complete completely furnished. We ordinarily <clears throat> cite that passage to prove that the Holy Spirit, through the Word, meets our every need, as indeed it does, and so it affirms. But there's a second idea there that ought not to be overlooked. Look at it. The man of God may be complete, item number one, completely furnished, item number two. What does that suggest? This. First of all, it meets my every need, supplying me with all the information necessary in order to my salvation. But secondly, it puts in my hand an instrument that is totally adequate to the discharge of my duty to all others. It not only fits me, it outfits me, thus meeting my every need. Well, someone might say, what harm is there? And a person thinking that his hunches, his intuition, his so-called inner leadings, are leadings of the Holy Spirit. What's wrong? In the first place, it's not so. I do not want to believe a falsehood regarding any matter, and particularly one that would affect my eternal well-being. As a matter of fact, such a view is itself an impeachment of the very passage that I've just cited. For now, watch. Let this represent the word, my finger here, these alleged additional influences. If such there are, then it takes the word plus these alleged additional influences in order for me to have all that God has for me. In which case the word's not enough. But it says it is. Is it? If I cannot rely upon that claim, upon which one of them may I? Secondly, I've observed that those who hold such views have a tendency to teach things that are contrary to the plainest teaching of the Spirit in the New Testament. And thirdly, to go on and on and on to further departures from the Word of Truth. And so it's an unsound and dangerous position to occupy the view or to hold the view that one is guided, directed by some mysterious, incomprehensible power, a subjective form of religion that has the tendency to lead people away from the only reliable source of divine in information, of course, the New Testament. If there's anything that's taught with peculiar emphasis, it is what is there set out. Oh, but sometimes people will say, but after all, we're, the Spirit is said to be in us, as indeed it does. The Scriptures do say. And I know of no one that ever questioned that. For example, in Romans 8 and 9, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Galatians 4 and 6, because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 11, the Spirit dwelleth in you. These passages assert a fact. They do not indicate a mode. What's common, though, is for people to take a statement asserting a fact and from that deduce a mode. But that's an incorrect hand, an illogical and improper hand. For example, the New Testament says the Spirit is in us. Now, what may I properly learn from that? There is a sense in which He's in us. But then, it does not tell me how. It does not say that He's in us bodily, personally, abstractly. All of that's read into these passages. All that I may properly learn is that there's a sense in which the Spirit is in us. We must learn from other passages 
how he's in us. The same book teaches us that the Father is in us. Listen, 1 John 4 and 15, He whosoever confesseth that Jesus has come in the flesh, God dwells in him, and he in God. The book teaches us that Christ is in us. Galatians 2.20, It's not I, it's Christ who lives in me. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So the book says the Father is in us, the Son is in us, the Holy Spirit is in us. No one has any difficulty with the statement that the Father is in us. No one thinks that means that there's a little bit of deity literally having come down from heaven and taking up its abode in our bodies. No one thinks that. When it is said that Christ is in us, no one in his right mind thinks that that means he's no longer in heaven, but has returned to the earth, dividing himself into as many portions as he has followers, literally injecting a portion of himself into each. Nobody thinks that. Everybody thinks and knows that when the book says that Christ is in us, that that means He's in us as His teaching, His will, is allowed to influence and dominate our lives. My friends, when I was a young preacher, attending Freed Hardeman College and beginning to preach here in West Tennessee, along with the great preachers of that day who were already in maturity, I recall that every one of those men, without an exception, defended the truth that the Scriptures meet our every need. It's only in the last decade or two that there are those among us who are now advocating a denominational concept of the work of the Holy Spirit. In those days, the ablest men among us debated the question on these very matters, and they refuted the arguments, the very same argument that are being made today by some who advocate a direct influence of the Spirit. There are those that say, well, but we have to have the Spirit to illuminate the Word. Imagine. Illuminate the Word. Well, who gave the Word in the first place? Well, of course, the Holy Spirit. But must it now be illuminated? If so, then He didn't do His work properly. That's a reflection upon the efficacy and the efficiency of the Spirit's work. But if he failed in the first instance, how do I know he won't in the second, or the third, or the fourth? Maybe I need an illumination of the illumination that illuminates the Word. Where do you stop? These are dangerous trends, friends. They are the precursors of apostasy. They lead people away from New Testament truth. And it makes no difference who it is that teaches it. It's dangerous doctrine. And I urge you to avoid it. But what about Acts 2.38? Didn't the Apostle Peter say, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now there, the gift of the Spirit is promised. But here again, there are those using poor theology and worse glamour, try to make that passage assert that what's their promise is the Holy Spirit. This is gross error. May I call your attention to a simple analysis, and those of you who have even basic remembrance of uh, English glamour will follow carefully. He is the subject of the sentence, shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the complete predicate. Shall receive is the verb of the predicate. It's a transitive verb. In the nature of the case, a transitive verb must have a direct object. The direct object must be in the accusative case. So in order to find what shall receive refers to, we must know where the objective or the accusative case is. Well, it's not the Spirit, because of the Spirit in the passage in the Greek text is in the genitive case, the same as our English possessive case. So the word gift there is the object of the verb, 
So what's there promised is not the Spirit, but a gift of the Spirit. Well, the gift of God was not God, but something God gave. The gift of Christ was not Christ, but something Christ gave. The gift of the Holy Spirit was not the Holy Spirit, but something the Holy Spirit gave. In that day, in the absence of a divine revelation, they had to have these miraculous gifts. And hands were laid on by the apostles to impart them. They give an exact example of that. Over in Acts 8, at verse 4, we're told the disciples were scattered abroad and everywhere preaching the word. Acts 8 and 5, Philip went down the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Acts 8 and 12, and they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. They were baptized, both men and women. Then, when the apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of the Lord, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now, mind you, they had not yet received the Spirit. The text says so. Look at it. For as yet he, uh, uh, they had been baptized only in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, they had not yet received the Holy Spirit. So they laid hands on them and imparted to them the Holy Spirit. Such then was the miraculous power characteristic of in every instance. And there are but two of them. The phrase, gift of the Spirit, refers to miraculous power. It's often said, and quite correctly, that the Bible is its own best interpreter. The only other instance in which the expression, the gift of the Spirit, occurs is in Acts 10 and verse 45. In that instance, this is the statement. On them was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, for we heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. How do you know, Luke, they had the gift of the Spirit? Because they were able to speak with tongues. If the Bible be allowed to define the phrase, that's what it means. If a speaker or writer uses a statement, he uses it in every instance in the same sense, unless he indicates a different usage. Otherwise, we'd simply be confused. The Holy Spirit uses this expression twice. One is the commentary on the other. Acts 10.45 explains the nature of Acts 2.38. One other point, and I must close. Have you ever thought about the far-reaching consequences of the idea of a so-called bodily indwelling of a part of the Godhead? Let me raise some questions for your contemplation. What was it that made our Lord an object of worship here on this earth? Well, it was because He was a deity in the flesh. God came down in the flesh. Our Lord actually lived in a human body here on earth? Yes. What is that? Incarnation. Well, what difference, friends, and consider this carefully, what difference would it make as to the incarnation and the object of worship, whether it is the second person of the Godhead or the third person of the Godhead? If the second person of the Godhead was an object of worship living in a human body, why wouldn't the third person of the Godhead literally living in a human body, being an object of worship. Are we prepared to bow down before each other? And the idea is, of course, ridiculous. And so is the viewpoint. And many have accepted. Why is it that some accept these views? Answer. They've been drinking too deeply from the wells of denominational theology. Friends, we have a great stake in these matters. We have an obligation to those who went before us to maintain earnestly and faithfully the faith delivered to the saints. I honor and feel a deep reverence for those great and godly men who paved the way for us in order that we might have a pure faith and a faultless practice. Let's don't let anybody take it away from us. To be a Christian, you must believe, repent of your sins, 
on confession of faith be baptized for the remission of sins, thus be added with the Lord to his New Testament church.